Hello there heroes, I'm the Orange Ranger and welcome to another comically long review. Today I'm starting another two-parter, but I'm not exactly splitting up a story. Something that tends to happen when comic series get really popular and go over one year in length is that you start getting annual issues. Those can be seen as sort of a celebration of the comics year with what ifs, Elseworld stories, just stuff that the writers couldn't find a way to fit into the main story itself. I think it's pretty safe to say by now that the Boom Studios Power Rangers comics are pretty successful and have definitely lasted more than a year, so indeed the annual issues have followed. I've had them on my comic reviewing list for a while, but besides the fact that I've had trouble finding time to do comic reviews, I just hadn't picked up the 2016 or 2017 annuals. With the annuals, I started with the 2018 edition, and that was really only because it directly directly tied in to the Shattered Grid event storyline. However, I am an orderly person. I like to do things in sequence. So I knew that if I was going to review the 2018 annual, I was going to have to read and review the 2016 and 2017 annuals as well, even if the stories weren't directly related. How convenient for me then that Boom Studios decided to re-release the 2016 and 2017 annuals in a trade compilation called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Lost Chronicles Volume 1. Now I'd be tempted to try to knock the entire thing out in one video, but I've been trying to keep my videos from getting too long, and together this thing is about as long as Power Rangers Aftershock, so I knew that wasn't going to work. And there just so happens to be a rather convenient division between the two things compiled in this book. So in this video, part one, I'll be looking at the 2016 annual stories. And in part two, we'll take a look at the 2017 stories. With all that said, let's take a look at the first half of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Lost Chronicles Volume 1, 2016. The cover is the 2017 Annuals cover, the six rangers in silhouette walking down a city street with their colors streaking behind them. Not bad. The first story is Week in the Life, written by former main series writer Kyle Higgins, with art by Rod Reese. Rice. Sorry. Honestly, there's not a whole lot to say about it. It's only six pages long and shows us a week in Jason's crazy life. The panels go through different times each day. We do get to see that this is apparently the week the Rangers fought Snizzard, so there's that. You get the sense through the story that Jason is just barely holding on to everything, but he always conveys this swagger and confidence that everything's fine, that he has time to train and do whatever needs to be done. The one main way we really see the strain on him is that on Saturday, he sleeps in until 5 p.m., before his communicator goes off and calls him to battle. It's a good enough story, I guess. I'm just not left with very much to say about it. It doesn't feel as much like a story, just like a look at Jason's weekly planner. A Week in the Life gets a three out of five. And oh, heroes, we have finally reached this one. I'm sure you've been anticipating it when you heard that I was going to be reviewing these stories. This is a story that's rather infamous all on its own as far as the comics, but especially in direct connection to me and my online identity. Let's take a look at Unlockly Heroes. Written by Ross Thibodeau, with art by Rob Guillory and Taylor Wells, the first page is actually a very cute last time on Power Rangers sequence. Billy was preparing to do a magic act in the talent show. What is it with Blue Rangers and magic anyway? But hey, this talent show will have free smoothies. Possibly. Rita, doing her usual stalking of the Rangers for monster inspiration, creates a monster that is a lock-based magician, sort of a Houdini monster, I guess, named Sir Loxalot. He opens a portal in his chest and sucks all five Rangers in. Tommy's not around. This must take place early in season one. So what happens now? Rita wins? Bulk and Skull are also seen preparing for the talent show, attaching balloons to a stick and spray painting them to look like heavy weights. When Skull asks why they aren't using real weights, Bulk points out that they're not that strong. What do we look like, Power Rangers? The two are then immediately teleported to the command center. 
What do I look like? A Power Ranger? Dang. So, here we go. The two think Ernie's just done some rather split-second redecorating, but Alpha and Zordon explain the situation. Since his five teenagers with attitude have been captured, Zordon's new plan was to choose two teens with even more attitude, giving them spare change, or I, I mean the extremely rare power coins from Eltar, and making the two of them Power Rangers. Farkas Volkmeyer, brash and powerful, commands the power of the Baconodon as the Purple Ranger, his Zord looking like a wild boar. And Eugene Skulovich, tough and unusual, commands the power of the Feather Dactyl, which looks like a giant chicken, as the Orange Ranger. This is why, when this story came out, a good number of people sought me out for opinion and reaction. And I know this is just a silly kind of what-if story, but it was still cool to see. Skull has become the Mighty Morphin Orange Ranger. And Boom actually considers these two fairly legit in their own universe. An example of that is that they've been doing these forever color covers, featuring all of the rangers of a given color. And Bulk is featured with the Purple Rangers. And Skull is lumped in with the Gold Rangers. Moving right along, Zordon teleports the two into battle. Rita sends down a group of putties, and the two freak out. Bulk leaps into Skull's arms, and the two start to run away, but Skull's pants drop, more on this in a bit, and the two fall, somehow activating a rolling energy ball attack that takes out the putties. Sir locks a lot attacks, and Bulk remembers Zordon telling him they are Angel Grove's only hope even seeing his words echoing in the word balloon. They use cockroach kung fu, slamming into the monster's face from either side and totally nailing it. To everyone's surprise. Now all that's left to do is to free the rangers. They call a locksmith, Pick Jaggers, cute, to open the monster's chest. Skull starts to open the door, but Bulk stops him a moment. This is their chance to really take advantage of this. Merchandising! Merchandising! Where the real money from the movie is made. However, Alpha puts the kibosh on that, zapping the two with a beam that simultaneously yanks their powers and wipes their memories of the experience. Nobody will ever know that Bulk and Skull were once Power Rangers. I was a little back and forth on this one. It's a cute what if story, and it was written in a way where I could actually imagine it happening on the show itself. However, it played that story just a little too much for humor for my liking. The primary example of that was their suits, which is something I said I'd get back to. Bulk's gut uncovered sticks out from his spandex, and inversely, Skull's pants are too baggy and his suit overall is just too big. It's pretty clear that the ranger suits form directly to their bodies, and even outside of canon, their spandex, they should be tight, period. It would have been just as funny for Bulk to just be a fat ranger with his gut sticking out in the spandex, but not through the spandex, and for Skull's suit to maybe like hang a little baggy on the arms or something. But overall, I heartily welcome Eugene Skullovich to the Orange Ranger Legacy and give Unlockly Heroes a score of 3.5 out of 5. We move on to what may have been something of an audition with A Spot of Trouble, written by Marguerite Bennett, who is now the current main writer on Power Rangers, with art by Huang Danian. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a story written for girls. The art style and the way the story is told just scream. This one's for the girls. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. Wow, a double cutaway. That's a first. Anyway, Trini and Kim are at the Barnes Botanical Gardens wearing long, pretty dresses with flowy hair that looks like there's a constant breeze. It's incredibly anime, very Sailor Moon. Trini is running some kind of fundraiser to save the animals or something. As she and Kim talk about protecting the animals, they suddenly hear those very animals start freaking out. They turn and see two things. One is an entire troop of anime pets in little dresses running away, 
and what they're running away from. Vixenia, some kind of fox or hyena monster. Kim whines that she didn't get all dressed up to fight a monster, so the monster says she'd look better wearing some fur and turns her into a bunny. Trini morphs, holding her morpher more like a brooch or maybe a phone. The two start fighting. Prepare to spend your life on four legs, human. We're just done with phrasing, right? That's not a thing anymore. You know, I didn't mention this during the Doom Signal review, but it's kind of neat to have used that once as a screen cap gag and now as a live action gag. Anyway, Trini starts to realize this monster really does just care about protecting the animals, meaning that maybe they're on the same side. She throws her daggers at the monster because they're on the same side and all. Vixenia catches one with her, I'm guessing here, tail, and goes to stab Trini with it, but Kim jumps in front of them. The monster stops, terrified that she almost hurt an animal. She realizes that Trini is right, that humans can do as much good as bad. She starts to change everyone back. Oh, the anime animals in the little dresses were people that had been changed. The story didn't really make that clear, and with the art style, I wasn't making any assumptions. But then Rita speaks into her mind, having sent Vixenia to destroy humans, not save animals. But apparently this isn't a mind control spell, just communication, as Trini talks her out of it again, and there's a plate literally stabbed into the ground here. Uh, anyway, she changes everyone back, including herself, I guess, turning into a regular-looking sort of fox kind of Okami sort of a thing. She promises to watch over the animals in the city while waiting for the humans to learn to take care of the animals. In beautifully pleasant irony, the debutantes being changed into animals showed them how helpless the animals are and inspired them to donate to the protection cause. Vixenia then watches from nearby, smiling as the party goes on. This story is cute, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. I actually really appreciate how this story managed to tell an entertaining Power Rangers tale strictly from the girl's perspective showing that Power Rangers can be for anyone. But that's also actually its downside, because while Power Rangers is for anyone, I think it's at its best when it's for everyone. The male Rangers are completely excluded from the story, not even showing up when there's a monster attack and a Ranger has morphed, and neither of the girls even wonders where they were. This one's for the girls indeed. I want Power Rangers to include women, not to focus on women, or on men for that matter, just everybody. A Spot of Trouble gets a 3.5 out of 5. We move on to probably the strongest story in this annual, uh, Only the Strong, written by Trey Moore with art by Terry Moore and, um, Hi-Fi? From what I can tell, Hi-Fi is a comic coloring company founded by colorist Brian Miller. Interesting. Only the Strong is backstory for Goldar. We see his pack invading a world, causing destruction and chaos. Goldar narrates that alongside him is the pack's greatest fighter, his brother, Silverback. Their pack serves Lord Zed, and by the by, this story does a great job of establishing Goldar's past with Lord Zed, which explains why Goldar just flips to Lord Zed from Rita when he returns and immediately calls him a greater leader. Also, we see right away that Silverback has Goldar's famous sword, which is gold. Goldar wields an axe, which is silver. Maybe they were just trading weapons that day. Anyway, they clear the place out and exposit to their warriors what they already know, that Lord Zed is fighting against Zordon and Eltar. An emissary of Zed's arrives and says the two have been summoned. Goldar is nervous, but Silverback is confident, feeling Zed has called them to finally attack Eltar itself. He also points out the rumors that Zed's appearance is due to his failed attempt to claim the Zeo Crystal. Lord Zed is on a ship that for whatever reason is being guarded by two Kuros, the grunts from Resha Sentai Tokyuger. 
Silverback starts expressing some rather traitorous thoughts, feeling Zed has become a weak coward, too afraid to push the war forward. He even says that if Zed has not called them to invade Eltar, he'll take matters into his own hands. As they arrive, another emissary reports that Zordon has broken through their blockade and seems to be headed to Earth, perhaps to try and claim the Zeo Crystal. Zed says he's taking care of that, claiming the palace that guards it and leaving the witch there to secure it. The other emissary points out Ninjor is rumored to be on Earth, and Zed says Zordon cannot be allowed to find the one who empowered the equations. This pushes Silverback's button, so he speaks up and basically announces their presence. Goldar defers, but Silverback gets right to the point, saying he can have his forces ready to invade Eltar within the hour. Zed tells them that is not their mission. Instead, he's sending them to Earth to pursue Zordon, stopping him at all costs. And that's enough for Silverback. He takes out his sword and drops it, a gesture similar to slapping a knight with a glove, I guess, saying that maybe they should go work for someone like Dark Spectre instead. This inspires Zed to throw off his cloak, revealing the form we're all familiar with, but they haven't seen before. He zaps Silverback, well, back, showing he's not nearly so weak as he thought. Silverback pants for his brother's help, but Zed points out that Silverback is a traitor, and what do we do with traitors? Goldar says they eliminate them, but ironically enough, what convinces him are Silverback's own words turned against him. In asking his brother for help, he showed weakness, and that weakness betrayed all they believe in. Zed taps the sword over to Goldar, and Goldar kills his own brother. Goldar still doesn't really get this mission, feeling it's a waste of his talents, but Zed has proven himself a worthy master, so he'll obey. After all, how much trouble can one Eltarian really be? This is a fantastic story, adding to Goldar's character and backstory. I couldn't remember or find exactly where, but I'm pretty sure that Silverback is referenced to in the mainline comic itself, meaning that this story is actually canon at the very least to the comics. But it also works to make sure that it's carefully fit into canon for the show itself and just really has a lot of emotion and meaning even beyond that. Only the strong gets a five out of five. Let's go from the story I like the most to the one that I very easily like the least. It's Putty Time, which was both written and illustrated by James Kochalka. This story is Power Rangers by kindergartners in both art style and dialogue. Don't get me wrong, I understand that it's intentional, but that doesn't mean that I enjoyed it anymore. Kim and Tommy are fighting a group of putties. Tommy loves beating up putties, but Kim hates the putties are forced to fight them and wonders if they have feelings. Tommy thinks that's silly, but cute, just telling her not to get too derpy. She's too cute to be derpy. As they walk off, one of the putties wakes up, begging them to come back and professing his love for the Pink Ranger. We head over to the juice bar where Tommy is introducing a new kid, very clearly the putty in disguise, who wants to train. The putty goes for Kim immediately, professing his love, but she is not impressed. Though she is impressed that she smacked him pretty hard, and he just keeps coming back. She kicks him in the face, and he falls. His wig pops off, and it wasn't even a wig, but a bird's nest. Tommy is amazed the putties do seem to have feelings, but Kim is just creeped out. I hate to borrow from Linkara again, but... We hope you've enjoyed No Moral Theater, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, there's something to be said for trying a really simplistic Sunday morning comic style with something like Power Rangers in both art and writing. In fact, it has been said there's actually a certain level of talent required to make something look low effort while it actually wasn't. The problem was, this actually felt low effort. The art style was intentional, and I understand that, but the story was incredibly simplistic and I didn't care. This one was just an eye roller for sure and felt out of place with the other stories. It's Putty Time gets a two out of five. 
So, all right, let's get to the next story here, and oh my. Kill it with fire! Uh, okay. Sure. This story is called What Makes a Ranger, written and drawn by Jorge Corona. Zordon here, by way of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze, asks Alpha for a status update on the Rangers, and it's not good. We see the Rangers, with Jason apparently wearing one of those muscle suit Halloween costumes, in the Megazord cockpit fighting against a monster who's also actually piloting a giant robot. The monster is Commandant, and he's piloting his war golem. A little girl sees the Megazord and Dragonzord fighting the monster and decides she needs a better look running up the stairs to go up a building. But that must be one tall staircase based on the perspective change here. Throughout the comic, Zordon is basically giving Alpha a reassuring monologue that describes the action. The Golem knocks the Zords down before Trini has Billy fire one of the Megazord's arms at the Golem. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Besides that not ever being a thing that we've seen this Megazord to be capable of doing, we just had the pilot of one of the legs tell the pilot of the other leg to fire one of the arms. Billy even gets back into his individual cockpit, implying that he's piloting the arm. That's not his Zord, that's Zack's Zord. Anyway, the arm hits the golem in the face, knocking the Commandant out of it. The rangers leap at the monster and could Zordon, this art is terrible. I'm sorry, it is. This is that Ren and Stimpy, or Rocco's Modern Life art style, and I'm really not a fan of it. Lots of dark lines and over-exaggerated features. Look at Trini! Why is her suit baggy above the waist? This is the thing with Skull's pants all over again. Why does she have cottage cheese thighs? Why is Kim Escher girl posing in the air? What the crud is Zack even doing? Excuse me, why? The rangers land around the monster, that apparently being enough. Tommy watches with smug satisfaction as Jason faces totally the wrong direction. He must be thinking, uh, this is why Zordon's gonna make me the leader when I get new powers. Kim tells the other rangers they aren't done yet, there's been a lot of collateral damage, and there are people that need saving. The girl, who was going to go upstairs to get a better view of the Zord fight, is back on the ground, but alive for some reason, and someone finds her. Is it the Pink Ranger? Yes! No! Uh, it's Kimberly. The Rangers have demorphed, though I can't possibly imagine why, except to demonstrate the lesson of the comic, that what makes the Rangers heroes isn't their powers, it's their bravery. What definitely doesn't make them heroes is their laundry skills and sense of general fashion. Kim decided that going through a torn up attack site in a dress was a good idea. I'm not even sure what Trini's supposed to be wearing. A long sleeved sweater dress with long wrinkled boots? Billy is wearing overalls, which is consistent with his early appearances, but by the time Tommy showed up, I'm not sure that was the case anymore. Jason and Zack seem okay, but it also occurs to me that everyone is wearing long sleeves. They do know that Angel Grove is in California, right? And Zordon's face is going to haunt my nightmares forever. That, heroes, is a leer. That is scary look. Zordon used scary look and it was very effective. Orange Ranger fled the battle. Zordon gets 450 XP and learn the move Disturbing Glare. There's a good story in there somewhere, but just like the little girl in the apartment building that Kimberly rescued, it gets absolutely buried, in this case by just terrible, horrible artwork. And in fact, the story with the little girl was actually kind of confusing. What Makes a Ranger gets a 1 out of 5. And that's going to do it for the 2016 annual portion of Lost Chronicles Volume 1. Only the strong and a spot of trouble are the standouts, though I did have my issues with the spot of trouble as I described. What makes a ranger and its putty time really bring this thing down, though? And yes, Unlockly Heroes adds to the grand stable of orange rangers, as small as it is. So as much as I didn't enjoy the story, it's going to hold a special place in my mind. 
So I averaged the scores that I gave each of these six stories and came up with 2.9 out of 5. And that's actually pretty fitting and close to my overall score because overall I think this thing had two really good stories, two really bad stories, and two kind of middle of the road stories. So overall, it wasn't something that I minded reading, but it wasn't superstar entertainment either. The 2016 MMPR annual gets a score of three out of five. Next time, I'll be flipping the calendar over to 2017, covering the five stories that were part of the Mighty Morphin 2017 annual, as well as another story exclusive to this Lost Chronicles compilation. Sort of exclusive to this compilation. But for now, that's going to do it for another comically long review. Thank you, Hero, so much as always for watching. In the comments below, let me know what you thought of these stories. Which one was your favorite? Which one did you hate the most? And let me know what you thought of my review of them as well. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel to see all of my videos and ring that bell. Get your notifications set up so you get notified of whenever I post brand new videos, just like these comically long review videos. And if you really like the work that I'm doing here, really appreciate me reviewing these comics, and you wanted to toss me a little bit of financial support, you can head over to digitaltipjar.com slash orangerangervid, toss a little tip change in the jar right there, and I'll be grateful for anything that lands inside. Also in the comments below, let me know if there are any other crowdfunding kind of platforms, Patreon, Coffee, etc., that you're interested in me getting on. Just checking the waters there again. Until next time, heroes, may the power protect you. With all that said, let's take a first look. Let's take a look at Unlockly Heroes, written by Ross Thibodeau with... As the two, Trini and Kim, talk about protecting the... Uh, you know, I didn't mention this during the Doom Signal review, but it's kind of a... She starts she... There's a plate literally stabbed into the ground here, by the way. Um, anyway, she changes everyone... Yeah, I'm gonna do that again. I actually really appreciate how this story managed to tell an entertaining Power Rangers tale strictly from the girl's perspective. They just aren't in the story for some reason. It's called It's Putty Time, and was both written and illustrated by James Kolchak. Listen, there's something to be said for trying a sort of Sunday morning comic style with Power Rangers. It's really simplistic and... Listen, there is something to be said for trying a simpler sort of Sunday morning comic style with Power Rangers in both art and story overall. Yeah. The monster is Commandant, and his <laughs> The monster is Commandant, and he, he fucks Zordon here, by way of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze. Ask Alpha for a story update, a story update. Fuck. Lots of dark lines and over-exaggerated jet <laughs> Look at Trini. Why is her suit baggy above the waist? This is the thing with Jason and Zack seem okay, but it occurs to me that everyone is wearing long, 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 something that I terribly minded reading, but nothing super fantastic amazing either. I'm going to do that again. So I averaged the six scores that I gave these stories. So I averaged the scores that I gave these six stories and ended up with a score of 2.9 out of 5. And that's actually really, that's actually really, so I average the scores that, next time I'm flipping the calendar over to the 2017 side of the, 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 next time I'm flipping the calendar over to 2017, covering the five stories that were in the 2017 annual for the part two, ba, 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 ba. what am I trying to say?